frustration. There's going to be a lot of frustration before this is all over, but I mean, there, it's already been years of frustration for a lot of people, so they're going to have to learn to live with it. Serial killer Israel Keys could have had a normal, all-American life. He was a former army infantryman who served his country proudly at Fort Hood and in Egypt. After his time in the armed forces, he started a construction company in Alaska. He even had a daughter of his own. But behind the seemingly normal veneer of respectability lay a heart of pure darkness. A darkness that even shocked the FBI. When asked by investigators why he committed his crimes, Keyes simply replied, why not? As a serial killer, Keyes targeted victims who happened to cross his path, making him one of the scariest killers of the 21st century. Welcome or welcome back to True Stories, join our family in exploring some of the most twisted true crime cases. As always, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. Keyes was born in Cove, Utah, on January 7, 1978. He's the second of ten children born to Heidi and John Jeffrey Keyes, a couple who didn't believe in government interference, public schools or modern medicine. Keyes was a toddler when his family left Utah for Colville, Washington. They lived an isolated existence in the woods, where Keyes grew up without heat or electricity. The Keyes family were faithful parishioners of a Christian identity church called the Ark, whose minister, Dan Henry, preached a white supremacist gospel, and the family strictly abide by the religion. Israel Keyes began showing the first signs of psychopathy in his childhood, he had most of the traits associated with most serial killers. Growing up, Keyes broke into neighbors' homes to steal guns, loved hunting, would pursue anything with a heartbeat, and torture animals. While in custody Keyes himself said, I've known since I was 14 that there were things that I thought were normal and that were okay, that nobody else seemed to think were normal and okay. After a teenaged Keyes told his family he no longer shared their faith, his father cut ties, though he remained close to his mother. Israel Keyes later confessed that he committed his first crime in 1998, shortly after he enlisted in the U.S. Army. The details of that first crime are unclear, but people who served with Keyes remembered him as often drunk and withdrawn throughout his service. After his honorable discharge in July 2001, he lived on the Maca Reservation with the mother of his daughter. Keyes received a DUI while in the Army, but otherwise had had no trouble with the law. In 2001, Keyes began his killing spree in earnest. Keyes chose his victims at random and said that they were more victims of opportunity. He would often wait to accost people in places like parks, cemeteries or campgrounds. But not as much to choose from, but because there were also no witnesses. There's no one else around, he told authorities. This was so he could avoid detection. Back when I was smart, I would let them come to me. Just remote area. Come, come go to a remote area that's not anywhere near where you live. Keys had murder kits stashed around the country the with all the murder to tools he would need. Exactly he crisscrossed the country to hide caches of murder equipment speaking, that consisted of guns, ammunition and chemicals no for the destruction of bodies. Really he also around. paid in cash and would take the battery out of his cell phone as he drove to further fly under the radar. However, perhaps a factor that he thought made him a better person, he had one hard and fast rule, he would never target or kill children or anyone who had a child because he had a daughter of his own. But by no means was Israel Keyes showing any sort of mercy towards his victims. To prove his supremacy and ensure he would never be caught, Keyes went to some extreme lengths. Keyes studied the work of FBI profilers and learned about serial killers like Ted Bundy. But this wasn't the end of it, Keyes had been fitted with a gastric band and had visited a plastic surgery clinic in Mexico. It is speculated that Keyes might have been trying to become a better killer who leaves no trace. A lap band could mean he wouldn't get hungry as often, and he might have changed his fingerprints or removed body hair to lessen the chances of leaving evidence behind. His first confirmed kill was a Vermont couple named Bill and Lorraine Courier, whose bodies were never found. Keyes reportedly broke into the Courier's home on the night of June 8, 2011, instigating what he dubbed a blitz attack on the pair, cutting their phone line before entering their home while wearing a headlamp and tying them up before driving them to an abandoned farmhouse. He shot Bill Courier in the basement with a .22 caliber and sexually assaulted and strangled Lorraine Courier. Keyes would continue killing across states without leaving any trace. In fact, he had no police record, and when he would be later arrested, authorities would say that they had no idea he existed. 
Keyes made sure he was that good. But as we all know, pride come before a fall. His downfall would come once he set his eyes on Samantha Koenig in 2012. February 1, 2012, began like any other day at work for 18-year-old Samantha Koenig, but it ended in unspeakable tragedy. Finishing up her shift at the Common Grounds coffee stand in downtown Anchorage, Alaska, the young barista was approached by a man wearing a ski mask who ordered coffee. After Samantha handed him the order, Keyes pulled out a gun and demanded money, and the terrified teen quickly complied. Forcing himself inside the stand, Keyes tied the young woman's hands together with zip ties before forcing her into his white Ford Focus, where she tried and failed to escape the abductor who held a gun to her head and said he would kill her if she tried again. Driving around town with Samantha still bound in the vehicle, Keyes explained to the terrified teen that this was simply a kidnapping for ransom and that if she cooperated, she'd be returned to her family unharmed. Keys kept Samantha alive for several hours and even drove back to her coffee stand to retrieve her mobile phone. He then used it to send a fake text message to her boyfriend, who was due to pick her up after her shift. The text read, hey, I'm spending a couple of days with friends, let my dad know. Keys took Samantha to his property, where he tied her up in a shed. He turned his radio up so no one could hear her screams and pleas for help. After demanding Samantha's address, Keyes made his way to retrieve her ATM card from her boyfriend's truck. In a gut-wrenching twist, while stealing the debit card, Keyes was confronted by Samantha's boyfriend, who was already on edge, after discovering Koenig was not at work, when he arrived to pick her up as well as having received the strange text message from her phone earlier, which had, in fact, been sent by Keyes. Thinking he was a random burglar attempting to break into his car, Samantha's boyfriend ran inside to get help, while Keyes fled. Returning to his property, Keyes poured himself a glass of wine as he returned to his shed and raped a sobbing Samantha. He then strangled her to death. Keyes returned inside, packed for a pre-planned cruise in New Orleans, woke his daughter for school, and left for the airport. Returning to Anchorage on February 17, 2012, Keyes began preparing a ransom note, but first, he decided to remove Samantha's body from the cupboard. He applied makeup to Samantha's face, frozen and lifeless, before unsettlingly sewing her eyes open with fishing line to give her the appearance of being alive. He then took a Polaroid of her holding up that day's newspaper. Keyes typed a note demanding $30,000, and he left this, as well as the photograph of Samantha staged to look alive, in a park under a memorial flyer of a dog named Albert, before using Samantha's phone to text her boyfriend. A few days later, Keyes drove to Matanuska Lake, dismembered her body, cut a hole in the ice, and dumped her remains in the lake. At the same time, Samantha's father, James Koenig, believing his daughter was still alive, after seeing the sickening photograph, was depositing the ransom money into Keyes's account, with the $30,000 having been generously donated by members of the community. As he had instructed her family to deposit the money into her debit account, authorities were able to determine that the perpetrator was driving a white Ford Focus. Keyes was then being pulled over for a traffic stop, where authorities found dye-stained bills from a bank robbery, a ski mask, a gun, and Samantha's phone and debit card. Keyes was quickly arrested, and that would be the downfall of the self-proclaimed serial killer. If he hadn't become sloppy and killed Samantha Koenig in his hometown on that fateful day, authorities agree it's very likely he may never have been caught at all. Following the arrest, he admitted to abducting Samantha Koenig from the coffee stand. He would later give police more details, though on the condition that they made one promise, keep everything out of the press. The reason? He didn't want his young daughter to read about what he had done to Samantha. I'll tell you everything you want to know. I'll give it blow by blow if you want. I have lots more stories to tell," he told police. But even with the promise of cooperating with the police, Keyes still ensured he would taunt the authorities, giving them answers at his own pleasure, in a six-hour interrogation. Um, so talking about other crimes, um, uh, you know, we, we wanted to kind of pick up where we left off on some things, uh, give you any information that uh, you might be thinking about over the last few weeks. Right. You said you don't want to give up all your cards. We understand that. We'd love it if you just said, yeah, I'm just going to tell you everything. And frankly, I would, I would say things would move much more quickly. Oh, believe me, I'm very aware, well aware of passage of time. In order for things to progress, I have to 
take a guess as to what's going to happen next, I guess you could say. It, it's all, it's your schedule. However, he labeled fellow serial killer Dennis Rader, aka BTK, a wimp for professing remorse for his killings. He began telling authorities about all the other crimes he'd committed. In fact, he seemed to take pleasure in sharing the grisly details. But in May 2012, things began to take a downhill spiral after Keyes realized the weight of his actions and the consequences he would face. During a routine hearing, Keyes tried to escape from a courtroom after breaking his leg irons. Fortunately, his escape attempt was unsuccessful and authorities once again restrained him. But that was a sign of things to come. On December 2, 2012, Israel Keyes managed to conceal a razor blade in his jail cell at the Anchorage Correctional Complex in Alaska, which he used to take his own life. He left behind a note which offered no insight as to his additional victims. Even in his grave, he would still taunt the police. Under his body was a rambling letter that was later called a creepy ode to murder, which offered no clues as to the identities of his unnamed victims, it but rather on described them as pretty, that they weren't dealing with just a murder, but this was not the end of the, the coldest, story. Most methodical serial killers Alaskan of all time. authorities released Keys a drawing of 11 skulls and fellow killer Ted Bundy, which they claimed was drawn by Keyes as part himself of his suicide note. The note, which was written in his blood, was captioned with three words. We are one. According to the FBI, this is the most tacit acknowledgement by Israel Keys of the 11 lives he took without remorse. We've come to the end, thank you for watching, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Till next time.